the gardeners stayed a week at Longbourn. And what with the Phillipses, the Lucases, and the officers? There was not a day without its engagement. Mrs. Bennet had so carefully provided for the entertainment of her brother and sister that they did not once sit down to a family dinner. When the engagement was for home, some of the officers always made part of it of which officers Mr. Wickham was sure to be one. And on these occasions, Mrs. Gardiner, rendered suspicious by Elizabeth's warm commendation, narrowly observed them both, without supposing them, from what she saw, to be very seriously in love, their preference of each other was plain enough to make her a little uneasy, and she resolved to speak to Eliza, to Mrs. Gardiner, Wickham had one means of affording pleasure, unconnected with his general powers. About ten or a dozen years ago, before her marriage, she had spent a considerable time in that very part of Derbyshire to which he belonged. They had, therefore, many acquaintances in common, and though Wickham had been little there since the death of Darcy's father, it was yet in his power to give her fresher intelligence of her former friends, Mrs. Gardiner had seen Pemberley, and known the late Mr. Darcy by character perfectly well. Here, consequently, was an inexhaustible subject of discourse. In comparing her recollection of Pemberley with the minute description which Wickham could give, and in bestowing her tribute of praise on the character of its late possessor, she was delighting both him and herself. On being made acquainted with the present Mr. Darcy's treatment of him, she tried to remember some of that gentleman's reputed disposition when quite a lad which might agree with it, and was confident at last that she recollected having heard Mr. Fitzwilliam Darcy formerly spoken of as a very proud, ill-natured boy. Chapter 26 Mrs. Gardiner's caution to Elizabeth was punctually and kindly given on the first favorable opportunity of speaking to her alone. After honestly telling her what she thought, she Seriously, I would have you be on your guard. Do not involve yourself or endeavor to involve him in an affection which the want of fortune would make so very imprudent. I have nothing to say against him. He is a most interesting young man, and if he had the fortune he ought to have, I should think you could not do better. But, as it is, you must not let your fancy run away with you. You have sense, and we all expect you to use it. Your father would depend on your resolution and good conduct, I am sure. You must not disappoint your father. My dear aunt, this is being serious indeed. Yes, and I hope to engage you to be serious likewise. Well, I will take care of myself and of Mr. Wickham too. He shall not be in love with me, if I can prevent it. Elizabeth, you are not serious now. I beg your pardon. I will try again. At present I am not in love with Mr. Wickham, no, I certainly am not. But he is, beyond all comparison, the most agreeable man I ever saw, and if he becomes really attached to me, I believe it will be better that he should not. I see the imprudence of it. Oh, that abominable Mr. Darcy, my father's opinion of me does me the greatest honor, and I should be miserable to forfeit it. My father, however, is partial to Mr. Wickham. In short, my dear aunt, I should be very sorry to be the means of making any of you unhappy, but since we see every day that where there is affection, young people are seldom withheld by immediate, I will not be in a hurry to believe myself his first object. When I am in company with him, I will not be wishing. In short, I will do my best. Perhaps it will be as well if you discourage his coming here so very often. At least, you should not remind your mother of inviting him. As I did the other day, said Elizabeth with a conscious smile. Very true, it will be wise in me to refrain, but do not imagine that he is always here so often. It is on your account that he has been so frequently invited this week. You know my mother's ideas as to the necessity of constant company for her friends. But really, and upon my honor, 
I will try to do what I think to be the wisest. And now I hope you are satisfied. Her aunt assured her that she was, and Elizabeth having Mr. Collins returned into Hertfordshire soon after it had been quitted by the gardeners and Jane, but as he took up his abode with the Lucases, his arrival was no great inconvenience to Mrs. Bennet. His marriage was now fast approaching, and she was at length so far resigned as to think it inevitable and even repeatedly to say, in an ill-natured tone, as they went downstairs together, Charlotte said, I shall depend on hearing from you very often, Eliza, that you certainly shall, and I have another favor to ask. Will you come and see me? We shall often meet in Hertfordshire. I am not likely to leave Kent for some time. Promise me, therefore, to come to Hunsford. Elizabeth could not refuse, though she foresaw little pleasure in the visit. My father and Maria are coming to me in March, added Charlotte, and I hope you will consent to be of the party. Indeed, Eliza, you will be as welcome as either of them. The wedding took place. The bride and bridegroom set off for Kent from the church door, and everybody Elizabeth soon heard from her friend and their correspondence was as regular and frequent as it had ever been. That it should be equally unreserved was impossible. Elizabeth could never address her without feeling that all the comfort of intimacy was over, and though determined not to slacken as a correspondent, it was for the sake of what had been, rather than what... Charlotte's first letters were received with a good deal of eagerness. There could not but be curiosity to know how she would speak of her new home, how she would like Lady Catherine, and how happy she would be. She wrote cheerfully, seemed surrounded with comforts, and mentioned nothing which she could not praise. The house, furniture, neighborhood, and roads were all to her taste, and Lady Catherine's behavior was most friendly and obliging. It was Mr. Collins' picture of Hunsford and Rosings rationally softened, and Elizabeth perceived that she must wait for her own visit there to know the rest. Jane had already written a few lines to her sister to announce their safe arrival in London, and when she wrote again, Elizabeth hoped it would be in her power to say something of the Bingleys. Her impatience for this second letter was as well rewarded as impatience generally is. Jane had been a week in town without either seeing or hearing from Caroline. She accounted for it, however, by supposing that her last letter to her friend from Longbourn had by some accident been lost. My aunt, she continued, is going tomorrow into that part of the town, and I shall take the opportunity of calling in Grosvenor Street. She wrote again when the visit was paid. I did not think Caroline in spirits were her words, but she was very glad to see me, and reproached me for giving her no notice of my coming to London. I was right, therefore. My last letter had never reached her. I inquired after their brother, of course. He was well, but so much engaged with Mr. Darcy that they scarcely ever saw him. I found that Miss Darcy was expected to dinner. I wish I could see her. My visit was not long, as Caroline and Mrs. Hurst were going out. I dare say I shall see them soon here. Elizabeth shook her head over this letter. It convinced her that accident only could discover to Mr. Bingley her sister's being in town. Four weeks passed away, and Jane saw nothing of him. She endeavored to persuade herself that she did not regret it, but she could no longer be blind to Miss Bingley's inattention. After waiting at home every morning for a fortnight, and inventing every evening a fresh excuse for her, the visitor did at last appear. But the shortness of her stay, and yet the letter which she wrote on this occasion to her sister will prove what she felt. My dearest Lizzie will, I am sure, be incapable of triumphing in her better judgment, at my expense, when I confess myself to have been entirely deceived in Miss Bingley's. But, my dear sister, though the event has proved you right, do not think me obstinate if I still assert that, considering what her behavior was, my confidence was as natural as your suspicion. 
I do not at all comprehend her reason for wishing to be intimate with me, but if the same circumstances were to happen again, I am sure I should be deceived again. Caroline did not return my visit till yesterday. And not a note, not a line, did I receive in the meantime. When she did come, it was very evident that she had no pleasure in it. She made a slight, formal apology for not calling before, said not a word of wishing to see me again. I pity, though I cannot help blaming her. She was very wrong in singling me out as she did. I can safely say that every advance to intimacy began on her side. But I pity her because she must feel that she has been acting wrong, and because I am very sure that anxiety for her brother is the cause of it. I need not explain myself farther. And though we know this anxiety to be quite needless, yet if she feels it, it will easily account for her behavior to me, and so deserve it. I cannot but wonder, however, at her having any such fears now, because, if he had at all cared about me, we must have met long ago. He knows of my being in town, I am certain, from something she said herself. And yet it would seem by her manner of talking, as if she wanted to persuade herself that I cannot understand it. If I were not afraid of judging harshly, I should be almost tempted to say that there is a strong appearance of duplicity in all this. But I will endeavor to banish every painful thought, and think only of what will make me happy your affection, and the invariable kindness of my dear uncle and aunt. Let me hear from you very soon. Miss Bingley said something of his never returning to Netherfield again, of giving up the house, but not with any certainty. We had better not mention it. I am extremely glad that you have such pleasant accounts from our friends at Hunsford. Pray go to see them, with Sir William and Mary. I am sure you will be very comfortable there. Yours, it so this letter gave Elizabeth some pain. But her spirits returned as she considered that Jane would no longer be duped. By the all expectation from the brother was now absolutely over. She would not even wish for a renewal of his attentions. His character sunk on every review of it. And as a punishment for him, as well as a possible advantage to Jane, she seriously hoped he might really soon marry Mr. Darcy's sister. As by Wickham's account, she would make him abundantly regret what he had thrown away. Mrs. Gardiner about this time reminded Elizabeth of her promise concerning that gentleman, and required information, and Elizabeth had such to send as might rather give contentment to her aunt than to her son. His apparent partiality had subsided, his attentions were over, he was the admirer of someone else. Elizabeth was watchful enough to see it all, but she could see it and write of it without material pain. Her heart had been but slightly touched, and her vanity was satisfied with believing that she would have been his only choice, had fortune permitted it. The sudden acquisition of ten thousand pounds was the most remarkable charm of the young lady to whom he was now rendering himself agreeable. But Elizabeth, less clear-sighted perhaps in this, nothing, on the contrary, could be more natural, and while able to suppose that it cost him a few struggles to relinquish her, she was ready to allow it a wise and desirable man. All this was acknowledged to Mrs. Gardiner, and after relating the circumstances, she thus went on, I am now convinced, my dear aunt, that I have never been much in love, for had I really experienced that, but my feelings are not only cordial towards him, they are even impartial towards Miss King. I cannot find out that I hate her at all, or that I am in the least unwilling to think her a very good sort of girl. There can be no love in all this. My watchfulness has been effectual and though I certainly should be a more interesting object to all my acquaintances were I distractedly in love with him, I cannot say that I regret my comparative importance may sometimes be purchased too dearly. Kitty and Lydia take his defection much more to heart than I do. They are young in the ways of the world, and not yet open to the mortifying conviction that handsome young men must have something to live on as well as the plain chapter 27 with no greater events than these March was to take Elizabeth to Hunsford. She had not at first thought very seriously of going thither, but Charlotte, 
she soon found, was depending on the plan, and she gradually learned to consider it herself with greater pleasure as well. Absence had increased her desire of seeing Charlotte again, and weakened her disgust of Mr. Collins. There was novelty in the scheme, and as, with such a mother and such uncompanionable sisters, home could not be faultless, a little change was not unwelcome for its own sake. The journey would moreover give her a peep at Jane. And, in short, as the time drew near, she would have been very sorry for any delay. Everything, however, went on smoothly, and was finally settled according to Charlotte's first sketch. She was to accompany Sir William and his second daughter. The improvement of spending a night in London was added in time, and the plan became perfect as plain could be. The only pain was in leaving her father, who would certainly miss her, and who, when it came to the point, so little liked her going, that he told her to write to him, and almost the farewell between herself and Mr. Wickham was perfectly friendly, on his side even more. His present pursuit could not make him forget that Elizabeth had been the first to excite and to deserve his attention, the first to listen and to pity, the first to be admired. And in his manner, her fellow travellers the next day were not of a kind to make her think him less agreeable. Sir William Lucas, and his daughter Maria, a good-humoured girl, but as empty-headed as himself, had nothing to say that could be worth hearing, and were listened to with about as Elizabeth loved absurdities, but she had known Sir William's too long. He could tell her nothing new of the wonders of his presentation and knighthood, and his civilities were worn out, like his information. It was a journey of only twenty-four miles, and they began it so early as to be in Gracechurch Street by noon. As they drove to Mr. Gardner's door, Jane was at a drawing-room window watching their arrival. When they entered the passage she was there to welcome them, and Elizabeth, looking earnestly in her face. On the stairs were a troop of little boys and girls, whose eagerness for their cousin's appearance would not allow them to wait in the drawing-room, and whose shyness as they had not seen her for a twelve-month. All was joy and kindness. The day passed most pleasantly away, the morning in bustle and shopping, and the evening at one of the theatres. Elizabeth then contrived to sit by her aunt. Their first object was her sister, and she was more grieved than astonished to hear, in reply to her minute inquiries, that though Jane always struggled to support her spirits, it was reasonable, however, to hope that they would not continue long. Mrs. Gardner gave her the particulars also of Miss Bingley's visit in Gracechurch Street, and repeated conversations occurring at different times between Jane and herself, which proved that the former had. Mrs. Gardner then rallied her niece on Wickham's desertion, and complimented her on bearing it so well. But my dear Elizabeth, she added, what sort of girl is Miss King? I should be sorry to think our friend mercenary. Pray, my dear aunt, what is the difference in man? I know no harm of her. But he paid her not the smallest attention till her grandfather's death made her mistress of this fortune. No, why should he, if it were not allowable for him to gain my... If she does not object to it, why should we? Her not objecting does not justify him. It only shows her being deficient in something herself, sense or feeling. Well, cried Elizabeth, have it as you choose. He shall be mercenary, and she shall be foolish. No, Lizzie, that is what I do not choose. I should be sorry, you know, to think ill of a young man who has lived so long in Derbyshire. Oh, if that is all, I have a very poor opinion of young men who live in Derbyshire. I am sick of them all. Thank heaven, I am going to-morrow where I shall find a man who has not one agreeable quality, who has neither manner nor sense to recommend him. Stupid men are the only ones worth knowing, after all. Take care, Lizzie. That speech savours strongly of disappointment. Before they were separated, we have not determined how far it shall carry us, said Mrs. Gardiner, but, perhaps, to the lakes. No scheme could have been more agreeable to Elizabeth, and her acceptance of the invitation was most ready and grateful. 
Oh, my dear, dear aunt, she rapturously cried, what delight, what felicity, you give me fresh life and vigor. Adieu to disappointment and spleen. What are young men to rocks and mountains? Oh, what hours of transport we shall spend, and when we do return, it shall not be like other travelers, without being able to. We will know where we have gone, we will recollect what we have seen. Lakes, mountains, and rivers shall not be jumbled together in our imaginations, nor when we attempt to describe any particular scene. Will we begin quarreling about its Let our first effusions be less insupportable than those of the generality of travelers. Chapter 28 Every object in the next day's journey was new and interesting to Elizabeth. When they left the high road for the lane to Huntsford, every eye was in search of the parsonage, and every turning expected to bring it in view. The palings of Rosings Park was their boundary on one side. Elizabeth smiled at the recollection of all that she had heard of its inhabitants. At length the parsonage was discernible. The garden sloping to the road, the house standing in it, the green pails and the laurel hedge, everything declared they were arriving. Mr. Collins and Charlotte appeared at the door, and the carriage stopped at the small gate, which led by a short gravel walk to the house, amidst the nods and smiles of the whole party. In a moment they were all out of the chaise, rejoicing at the sight of each other. Mrs. Collins welcomed her friend with the liveliest pleasure, and Elizabeth was more and more satisfied with coming when she found herself so affectionately received. She saw instantly that her cousin's manners were not altered by his marriage. His formal civility was just what it had been, and he detained her some minutes at the gate to hear and sat. They were then, with no other delay than his pointing out the neatness of the entrance, taken into the house. And as soon as they were in the parlor, he welcomed them a second time with ostentation. Elizabeth was prepared to see him in his glory and she could not help in fancying that in displaying the good proportion of the room, its aspect and its furniture, he addressed himself particularly to But though everything seemed neat and comfortable, she was not able to gratify him by any sigh of repentance, and rather looked with wonder at her friend that she could have so cheerful an air with such a companion. When Mr. Collins said anything of which his wife might reasonably be ashamed, which certainly was not unseldom, she involuntarily turned her eye on Charlotte. Once or twice she could discern a faint blush, but in general Charlotte wisely did not hear. After sitting long enough to admire every article of furniture in the room, from the sideboard to the fender, to give an account of their journey, and of all that had happened in London, Mr. Collins invited them to take a stroll in the garden, which was large and well laid out, and to the cultivation of which he attended himself. To work in this garden was one of his most respectable pleasures, and Elizabeth admired the command of countenance with which Charlotte talked of the healthfulness of the exercise, and owned she encouraged it as much. Here, leading the way through every walk and cross walk, and scarcely allowing them an interval to utter the praises he asked for, every view was pointed out with a minuteness which left be He could number the fields in every direction and could tell how many trees there were in the most distant clump. But of all the views which his garden, or which the country or kingdom could boast, none were to be compared with the prospect of rosings, afforded by an opening in the trees that bordered the park near. It was a handsome modern building, well situated on rising ground. From his garden Mr. Collins would have led them round his two meadows, but the ladies, not having shoes to encounter the remains of a white frost, turned back. And while Sir William accompanied him, it was rather small, but well built and convenient, and everything was fitted up and arranged with a neatness and consistency of which Elizabeth gave Charlotte all the credit. When Mr. Collins could be forgotten, there was really an air of great comfort throughout, and by Charlotte's evident enjoyment of it, Elizabeth supposed he must be often forgotten. She had already learnt 
that Lady Catherine was still in the country. It was spoken of again while they were at dinner, when Mr. Collins joining in observed, Yes, Miss Elizabeth, you will have the honor of seeing Lady Catherine de Boer on the ensuing Sunday at church, and I need not say you will be. She is all affability and condescension, and I doubt not but you will be honored with some portion of her notice when service is over. I have scarcely any hesitation in saying she will include you and my sister Maria in every invitation with which she honors us during your stay here. Her behavior to my dear Charlotte is charming. We dine at Rosings twice every week, and are never allowed to walk home. Her ladyship's carriage is regularly ordered for us. I should say, one of her ladyship's carriages, for she has several. Lady Catherine is a very respectable, sensible woman indeed, added Charlotte. She is the sort of woman whom one cannot regard with too much deference. The evening was spent chiefly in talking over Hertfordshire news, and telling again what had already been written. She had also to anticipate how her visit would pass, the quiet tenor of their usual employments, the vexatious interruptions of Mr. Collins, and the gaieties of their intercourse with Rosings. A lively imagination soon settled it all. About the middle of the next day, as she was in her room getting ready for a walk, a sudden noise below seemed to speak the whole house in confusion. And, after listening, she opened the door and met Maria in the landing place, who, breathless with agitation, cried out, Oh, my dear Eliza, pray make haste and come into the dining room, make haste, and come down this moment. Elizabeth asked questions in vain. Maria would tell her nothing more, and down they ran into the dining room, which fronted, and is this all, cried Elizabeth. I expected at least that the pigs were got into the garden, and here is nothing but Lady Catherine and her daughter. La, my dear, said Maria, quite shocked at the mistake, the old lady is Mrs., Jenkinson, who lives with them. The other is Miss de Boer. Only look at her. She is quite a little creature. Who would have thought that she could be so thin and small? She is abominably rude to keep Charlotte out of doors in all this wind. Why does she not come in? Oh, Charlotte says she hardly ever does. It is the greatest of favors when Miss de Boer comes in. I like her appearance, said Elizabeth struck with other ideas. She looks sickly and cross. Yes, she will do for him very well. She will make him a very proper wife. Mr. Mr. Collins and Charlotte were both standing at the gate in conversation with the ladies, and Sir William, to Elizabeth's high diversion, was stationed in the doorway, in earnest con. At length there was nothing more to be said. The ladies drove on, and the others returned into the house. Mr. Mr. Collins no sooner saw the two girls than he began to congratulate them on their good fortune, which Charlotte explained by letting them know that the whole party was asked to dine at Rosings the next day. Chapter 29 Mr. Collins' triumph, in consequence of this invitation, was complete. The power of displaying the grandeur of his patroness to his wondering visitors, and of letting them see her civility towards himself and his wife, was exactly what he had wished for. I confess, said he, that I should not have been at all surprised by her ladyship's asking us on Sunday to drink tea and spend the evening at Rosings. I rather expected from my knowledge of her affability that it would happen. But who could have foreseen such an attention as this? Who could have imagined that we should receive an invitation to dine there, an invitation, moreover, including the whole party, so immediately about the court? Such instances of elegant breeding are not uncommon. Scarcely anything was talked of the whole day or next morning but their visit to Rosings. Mr. Mr. 
Collins was carefully instructing them in what they were to expect, that the sight of such rooms, so many servants, and so splendid a dinner, might not wholly overpower them. When the ladies were separating for the toilet, he said to Elizabeth, Do not make yourself uneasy, my dear cousin, about your apparel. 